you think we better get it right at home before we can get it right at work? Oh my gosh, Tyler, where are you? You still here? My, you brought tears in my eyes. And your babe shows up and in public you say thank you. I've been married for 38 years, just like Sharon Lecter. Everybody goes, Clark, what's your secret? I've been living home six weeks ago, too. And it's going really, really well. You've been out of fight for a long time. All right, guys, excited for you to see this episode continuing in this theme of Meltdown in the Desert. Today, you're going to see the closing act from last Saturday. And this guy is an absolute legend. Like he's literally in the Speakers Hall of Fame. His mentor was Zig Ziglar. He was a co-author of Chicken Soup for the Soul, 150 million plus copies sold. Um, just an absolute legend. And I was just captivated by his speech. It was one of the best speeches I've ever heard, period. I'm talking about like on video or seen in person, the best. Um, and there's a really cool moment that happened in the very beginning um, that I'm excited for you to see as well. But um, definitely dig in and get as much as you can uh, from, this, from this episode because Dan Clark absolutely just crushes it. He's here, coming up next. I don't believe it. Dan Clark is here, the international speaker. No kidding. Achievers North America, Achievers Europe. Both of them named Dan Clark one of the top 10 speakers in the world. I thought I was one. He's one. He's a New York Times best-selling author. He's a singer. He's an a you got to be kidding. He's a singer, an athlete, a songwriter, a philanthropist, a screenwriter, an adventurer. He's everything. He's funny. He's inspirational. Hey, he's Dan Clark. He's changing the world one story at a time. Stay tuned. <laughs> Dan is the author of 21 books and a primary contributing author to the Chicken Soup of the Soul series, where one of Dan's world-famous stories was made into a film at Paramount Studios, starring Jack Lemmon. Dan's writing and speaking career began when he fought his way back from a paralyzing injury that cut short his football career. Zig Ziglar sponsored Dan into the National Speakers Association and for 25 years mentored Dan to become one of the most sought-after speakers on the planet. Dan has headlined the largest stages in the world, working with Fortune 500 companies, Super Bowl champions, military leaders, and government rulers who continually seek Dan's thought leadership, counsel, and inspiration. In 2005, Dan was inducted into the National Speakers Hall of Fame. Dan's extraordinary life includes flying fighter jets with the Air Force Thunderbirds, catching 9.4 Gs, going Mach 2 at twice the speed of sound, racing automobiles at the Nürburgring, serving on the Olympic Committee, and carrying the Olympic torch in the 2002 Winter Olympics, and soaring to the edge of space in a U-2 reconnaissance craft, where after a full day of training, accelerated to a classified altitude above 70,000 feet and for three and a half hours gazed into the blackness of space, witnessing the breathtaking curvature of the Earth and experienced a 15-mile high perspective on things as they really are. As CEO of the Art of Significance Leadership Development Corporation, Dan has interviewed and hung out with the most celebrated personalities of our time. Anne has appeared on over 500 TV and radio programs, including Oprah and Glenn Beck, and on the cover of Millionaire Magazine. But more important to Dan, and most significant of all, in 2012, Dan was named Utah Father of the Year. Truly a renaissance man for all reasons, who will help you transform your life from success to significance. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Dan Clark. I'm not smart enough to know one thing that Jesse Elder just talked about, but I gave him a standing ovation. I was not on the honor roll every time. Yes. 
Stephen Fielding. He's one of the smartest people on our planet. I honor you. And uh, you can't piss me off because I was not on the honor roll every time like you were. When you talk to Stephen about his, his educational experience, he can say things like he's only had one B in his whole life. And I thought, hey, dude, me too. <laughs> One time I came over with a report card that had four F's and one G on it. My dad's response, son, looks to me like you're spending too much time on one subject. <laughs> I love my dad. I have to apologize, you don't need another speaker. My clothes have gone out of style just since we started this meltdown. Um, I should have, should have called the Uber and gone to the mall and get some updated threads. This is long, and dude. <laughs> I mean, there were people out here that they stopped looking at their watches, they took them off like they didn't stop. <laughs> why, why have you had me at the end, but this is an honor. So in the four and a half hours that I've been asked to speak today, my desire <laughs> is to, to not teach you anything. I just want to remind you uh, about some things that I've learned, and then maybe conclude by lip-syncing three Britney Spears songs so you'll never be the same. <laughs> One thing that occurred to me in the middle of all these geniuses who have graced this stage is something that we all have learned from medicine. <clears throat> and that is, prescription before diagnosis is malpractice. And if you think about that, what we've all been conditioned to do is believe that if we want a better answer, we must ask a better question. So we spend our entire lives asking questions to get those better answers. And my precious time today is the closer. What I want to do is I want to question the answers. Because as a renegade, as a maverick, I love to challenge the status quo. And something that really blows my mind as an author, and I'm a weird duck. I spend so much time on the road visiting museums, going to historical sites, and then perusing the, the aisles of, of bookstores. I'm fascinated. I love to read. And obviously, I love to write the uh, video is a little obsolete. I've written 34 books so far. Hey, thanks for coming, man. I'm back. Uh, I'd like to start over. Can you show the video again, please? <laughs> <laughs> and as I walk up and down the aisles of the bookstores, one thing that occurs to all of us who have written a book is the sacred space called a bookshelf. And most books only sell about 5,000 copies in a bookstore, and they have a shelf life of about three weeks, and then the editors just, or the, the bookstore just finds the next selling book that comes from some publisher, and they just load up the bookshelves. A book that's continuously been on the bookshelf since it came out in 2001 is Good to Great by Jim Collins. I've been on the program with him many, many times. It's not my style to try and slam somebody or throw somebody under the bus to make me feel better about who I am. But as an author here at Meltdown, as an entrepreneur here at Meltdown, as one of us, we need to look at those bookshelves and ask a, a serious question. Has that book, or many other books like it, created limiting beliefs? Because 50% of the examples of great organizations in that book, Good to Great, were obsolete within the first nine years of publication. It came out in 2001. By 2009, where's Circuit City? Where's Borders? Where's Barnes & Noble? It's still around, but they're losing $750 million a quarter. They're not going to be around very long. Where's Blockbuster? Where's Kodak? Fannie Mae? They had about a five-page expose in Good to Great, and it single-handedly brought down the economy of the universe. There are people on Mars pissed off at Jim Collins' book. <laughs> Fay, Fannie Mae. So where's the book that doesn't have to be updated? And that's where I came up with my book called The Art of Significance Achieving the Level Beyond Success where I replace these 12 most common principles of success that have led to these limiting beliefs, and I replace them with what I call the 12 highest universal laws of life-changing leadership. I'm not going to bore you with those 12 laws. What I want to do as a storyteller is take you on an emotional roller coaster ride and share some stories that validate what Colby said right out of the shoots this morning, which seems about 15 weeks ago. <laughs> He said he wrote his book for one person. Will that one person be you? 
In Steve Jobin, they put together this meltdown for one person. And my question is that one person, you. We've heard all kinds of angles as we discuss time. And throughout my theory, my belief in time, today you've never been this old before. <laughs> and today you'll never be this young again, so right now matters and every right now matters, which means no matter what your past has been, you have a spotless future. <laughs> which means you can't always control what happens, but you can always control what happens next. Are you with me? Do you believe that one moment in time can change us forever? Yeah. Do you believe you can leave this magnificent pygmy Center for the Performing Arts, different than you were when you arrived. Do you really believe that one moment in time can change you forever? I do proof. I was on the program with Henry Winkler, the Fonzie from Happy Days, clearly one of the funniest guys I've ever met. The tragedy is some of you in this room are so young, you don't even know who I'm talking about. <laughs> He's the coolest guy who ever lived. You need to Google him. Yeah, hey, whoa. He started in the 1970s television sitcom called Happy Days, played this amazing character called the Fonz. Awesome. Henry Winkler and I, we finish our speeches. He decides he wants to take some time off, treat himself to a matinee movie. So he slides into the side exit door of the theater. As Henry Winkler shuffles himself through the aisle, he finds himself a vacant seat. As Henry Winkler turns to sit down in the chair to look over the movie screen, the little girl sitting right behind him smiles this giant smile. She points her finger and she slowly says, Fonzie! Henry Winkler immediately snaps into the Fonzie character from Happy Days. Hey, whoa. And the lady sitting next to the little girl passes out. <laughs> <laughs> Henry Winkler milks the moment. Whoa, I thought this only happened on TV drama. Hey, how cool is this? Whoa. Theater manager comes out, takes care of the woman's needs. She's lying in the aisle. Cold back on her forehead, she's asked one question, why did you pass out? She said, my little girl is autistic. And that is the very first word she has ever spoken in her entire life. I don't want to disagree with anyone who has graced this stage. But in my experience, one moment in time changes everything in my country song, Hook, in two more days, tomorrow's yesterday puts into words what Jesse was saying all along. What are we going to do right now? So may I just throw out some questions, challenge the questions, share some stories, and hopefully conclude with a meaningful poem? <laughs> <laughs> Question one. What I've heard all day long is, do you think we better get it right at home before we can get it right at work? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Tyler, where are you? Are you still here? My you brought tears in my eyes. And your babe shows up and in public you say thank you. I've been married for 38 years, just like Sharon Lecter. Everybody goes, Clark, what's your secret? I've only been home six weeks toe too. It's going really, really well. We haven't had a fight for a long time. Let me ask you, do you believe you gotta get a ride home before you can get a ride at work? I do, and I've heard this all day long. Illustrations. Preachers in the middle of the sermon, back door, the church slams open and walks the devil. All the church members climb out the windows, preacher slides out the back door, one good old boy stays in the church defiant. He's sitting on the bench, the devil walks up and says, apparently you don't know who I am. Good old boy says, yeah, you're Satan. The devil says, apparently you don't realize with one gesture I can have you cast to outer darkness. Old boy says, yeah. Devil says, apparently you don't realize with one word of my voice I can have you tormented for eternity, old boy says, yeah. Devil says, why aren't you afraid of me, old boy says, listen, I've been married to your sister for 42 years. <laughs> there's nothing you could ever do that would intimidate me. Let's talk. When we point, three fingers are pointing back at us. Next question, what are people saying behind your back? What are people saying behind your back? What are they really saying? Are you the same off stage as you are on stage? What's it about? Army sergeant calls up the commissary. Young private answers the phone. Sergeant says, tell me what we got. Private says, we have 1,500 rifles, 10 tanks, and one fat-headed sergeant's jeep. Sergeant says, what? Private says, yeah, we have 1,500 rifles, 10 tanks, and one fat-headed sergeant's jeep. Sergeant says, you know who this is? Private says, no. Sergeant says, this is a sergeant. <laughs> Private goes, oh, whoa. 
Do you know who this is? Surgeon says, no. He says, good. Bye-bye, fat head. <laughs> <laughs> what do people say behind our backs? A better question is, what are we saying about ourselves? Do you really know you? Do you like you? Do you realize that you're supposed to be here? And yet in the corporate world, we're always forced to just compare ourselves with others and compete against others. A couple years ago, I was the keynote speaker at an international convention on eating disorder. So as a professional speaker, I started reading up on anorexia and bulimia and just trying to become this closet expert so I could talk intelligently about what this was about. And before my speech, they kept calling it an eating disorder. So I started my speech, this doesn't have anything to do with food. And I tactfully singled out a young lady. And I said, excuse me, may, may we have a conversation? You don't have to answer verbally, and everybody else needs to answer the questions. I said, are you, are you tall or are you short? Are you wide or are you thin? Are you fast or are you slow? Are you smart or are you stupid? Are you pretty or are you pretty ugly? Says who? Compared to what? What is your name? Stacy. Stacy. Hi. Hi. Thanks for everything. If somehow we could take you and put you on this deserted island, you had no access to fashion magazines and no access to these, these Photoshop Twiggy models that are non-existent, would you suddenly love you just for who you are? This strong woman, this amazing human being. Why are we always caught up in let's sit around round tables and talk best practices? Best is only relevant depending on what you compare it against. Einstein said everybody's a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it's going to spend its entire life believing it is stupid. When are we going to wake up? Any of you watch a TV show, Jerry Springer? Please don't raise your hands, you shame. <laughs> Do we know people who watch Jerry Springer? Why do they watch it? Because they sit there with the Doritos and the beer and they look at that TV show and they actually believe, hey, my life sucks, but it doesn't suck as bad as your life. <laughs> because if we get divorced, at least we won't be cousins. <laughs> Best is only relevant depending on what you compare it against. So any of you golfers, we live, we're here in, in Arizona. Any of you golf? Where are the golfers? Any of you good? See, the hands go down. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I love golf. I lose balls in the ball washer. You think you had a tough year? I had my ball retriever regrip. We can talk about golf all day long. I'm an author. I have two new books coming out. How to line up your fifth putt. And also second shots up the ladies' tees. You want to go on and on and on? Tommy got a hold one the other day, he hit 300 yards dead straight, hit this guy right in the back, he pulls off the highway and comes and finds him. <laughs> Wrecks my whole weekend. Why do I bring up golf? Do you realize that if we had a meltdown golf tournament to raise money for Tomahawk, and we had a golf tournament on a golf course, 18-hole golf course with a 72 par, and I win the golf tournament because I shoot 125, and you all shoot 156, and I win because I suck less than you suck. That's a bad system. <laughs> Welcome to Reality 101. How dare us allow anyone else from now on or forevermore to reel us in and talk best practices competing against each other instead of becoming the very best versions of ourselves, which is why we're on this earth in the first place. Something that happened to me that doesn't happen to any other civilians I know. I've got a presidential signature. I was invited to Sword of the Edge of Space, October 23rd, 2010. Sword of the Edge of Space and U-2 reconnaissance aircraft, and because it's a classified mission, I can only tell you that at 70,000 feet above the Earth's surface, you see two-thirds of the state of California. At 80,000 feet, you see mapped outlines of America, and 90,000 feet, you actually tear up and believe you can reach out and touch the face of God. It was a spiritual experience I wish every one of you could have had. For almost five hours I sat in the sounds of silence, looking at the curvature of the earth, gazing through the endless blackness of the universe, pondering eternity, asking myself the deepest question of meltdown, why am I here? Right now, why am I here? 
I suppose if you remember nothing else I say today, will you please remember something that I think is so profound and so amazing? I believe in human orbits and divine rendezvous. So things happen to us for a reason. But it's our responsibility to determine what that reason is. Why did I meet Stephen Philby? Why did I meet Colby K? Why was I here today all day long, just as you were, to hear all these amazing speakers? Why are you here? And the challenge, really, I believe, came from Cody Jefferson. Early in the morning, he made a comment that I hope resonated with you as badly as it, and as deeply as it resonated with me. Instead of swapping cards with everyone here at Meltdown, what would happen if you just singled out one or two or three people that you could actually have a meaningful conversation with to find out who they are and why they are and what life is about? And if we get so caught up in only describing the enterprise where we work or our entrepreneurial ideas, shallow and shame on all of us. I've had so many experiences just today to have meaningful conversations that didn't last a long time. To look into people's eyes and to actually spend some time backstage with Scott Duffy and actually ask him, is that a spray on tan or cut the hair? Tell us about your, 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 your formula. What's the magic here? Sharon Lecter, unbelievable. She's like Mother Teresa. I have a picture of her on my wall with a red light and a rosary beads hanging. She's answered like three prayers a month since I met her. Oh, let's not forget about my buddy, Keith. Yeah, this guy is so amazing. What did he teach us? Focus. Focus and think bigger than we've ever thought before. I'm in space, ladies and gentlemen. And for the first time in my life, I asked the deepest question of all. Are we, mere, are we more than mere mortal beings living on a small planet for a short season? What's it really all about? Why are we here? And when we landed, that experience transformed my life forever. Because what occurred to me is that everything we can take with us when we die, I had aboard with me on that aircraft. Our education. We don't learn to know, we learn to do. All the information in the world can make a person successful. It's like the guy who has three PhDs, one in philosophy, one in psychology, one in sociology. He doesn't have a job, but at least he can explain why. <laughs> Our convictions. What do you really believe? We can take our character with us. Not trying to be controversial. Character is so critical because... Adversity is what introduces us to ourselves. No one will ever know how strong you are until being strong is your only choice. Do you get to know Stephen Fielding? I guarantee you walk away saying he is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Yeah. Right? I would write a song about Colby K, but I don't know what rhymes with stud muffin hunk of burning love. <laughs> and we had Pat Hilton in the room. Oh my gosh, he needs seven cups of coffee just to calm down. <laughs> but what was he about? Honesty, perseverance. I <laughs> like what Ken said. Yeah, sometimes you just have to be annoying. That was tactfully said, bro. <laughs> Annoying is persistent, is perseverance. It's so incredible what he's been able to do. And what does he do? He shares his honesty and his vulnerability through his music. He reminded me that if we're serious about becoming the best that we can be, to appreciate our education, to appreciate our convictions and deepen our beliefs, and most importantly, learn from our character, we better put ourselves in a position to use every talent we have to communicate that message to ourselves and to others who will listen. That's why I believe the secret to entrepreneurship is to start thinking like a songwriter. Any of you musicians besides Pat in the room? What do you do? 
play drums. Play drums. That's not a musician. You just beat the crap out of stuff. And the drums, that's cool. I'm just kidding you. It's the most important person in the recording studio. Go look up Ringo Starr. What do you do? Guitar. Dude, we have a meltdown band coming. <laughs> when someone asks you how many notes are there in music, it doesn't matter if we're musicians or not. We can revert back to the childhood days and play the do re mi game. Most people respond when I ask how many notes in music. They say seven notes in music and they count A, B, C, D, E, F, G, contraire, mon frere. In the year 1685, a very famous music composer of Western Europe decides he wants more options. He's got to put the black keys on the piano. If you look at the 88 keys on a keyboard, there are seven white notes and five black notes, a total of 12 notes in music. And those 12 notes repeat themselves every 12 notes. It's what we call an octave. And in the music business, we call it a chromatic scale, which allows us to write the music and you to perform the, the music we've written. Good system. What does that have to do with meltdown? What does that have to do with entrepreneurship? What does it have to do with social marketing, social media marketing? What does it have to do with any of us being here today, everything, and why? Because every single song ever written was written with the same 12 notes. Do you know this? The only difference between one song and another song is the order in which those 12 notes fall and the timing and spacing in between the notes. I wish I had a, a, a piano up here on stage. I could put on a magnificent display from the world of music to make my point. I could play a rock on a piano concerto using all 88 keys on the piano. I got some serious hits how I shot you when I met you at the out of jail by now. That's a favorite. <laughs> you ever have anybody who just bothers you all the time. That inspired one of my greatest hits of all time. How can I miss you if you won't go away? <laughs> Every single one of these songs in all genres was written with the same 12 notes. So here's my question of the day as a closer. What's the difference between a hit songwriter and a lousy songwriter? They have access to the same 12 notes. What's the difference between a great banker and a lousy banker? They have access to the same interest rates and the same economy. I drive 45 minutes one way to bank, and every once I've ever asked what the interest rates are on my loans. If money becomes the topic of conversation, it means the presentation is weak and the relationship is non-existent. What's the difference between a great entrepreneur who makes it and some who just sits around dreaming? The answer is the same. The difference between a hit songwriter and a lousy songwriter the difference between a Stephen Fielding and someone else, a Colby Kay and somebody else, a Stacy and somebody else, passion, creativity, and imagination. Sharon Lecter, one-on-one, -on -one, and everybody else who didn't choose those words that helped us feel what they were talking about. How many of you heard lately you gotta think outside the lines, you gotta think outside the box? What if the answers are still in the box? <laughs> Most people who come to meltdowns like this, most people who come to seminars like this, we, we, we come in search of the new answers. Come on, Clark, what's the pixie dust? Give me some secret sauce. You're poised, ready to take copious notes. Come on. When in reality, don't you think we ought to come in search of the right answers, and the right answers have always been right, or we can't call them right. The answers are inside of us. And because we become the average of the five people we associate with the most, we must be willing to pay any price and travel any distance to associate with extraordinary human beings who trigger more passion, creativity, and imagination. That's why I came to Meltdown. Is that not why you came to Meltdown? Too? And why each of us should take every single one of our personal challenges to invite two to five people next year to join us to increase the size of Meltdown by two, three, four times. I've been blown away today by every single speaker in his or her own way. And I, I suppose I'm basically speaking for all of us in this beautiful arena. Passion, creativity, and imagination. So let's just talk. Cody's talking about being a real man. I've got a few gold records in country music. My first gold record, in country music was the guy, with a guy by the name of Michael Peterson. We wrote Drink, Swear, Steal, and Lie. Yeah, I'm an inspirational genius. <laughs> I teamed up with another great songwriter, Don Schlitz. He wrote You Say It Best When You Say Nothing at All. That's a good song. <laughs> he wrote The Gambler for Kenny Rogers. He and I teamed up, put Kenny Rogers back on the charts. 
Little boy in his baseball hat stands in a field with his ball, and Daddy says, I'm the greatest. He throws the ball, swings, misses strike one, throws the ball, swings, misses strike two, throws the ball, swings, misses strike three, he's out. What does he say? Man, my good pitcher. That's a good song. I need to watch the music video. My best love song so far is called Real Man. Visualize Faith Hill singing and not me. She sings, I need a man who knows happily ever after is a day at a time proposition. Well, we heard that phrase today. I just defined it, clarified. I need a man who knows happily ever after is a day at a time proposition. A man who knows making love is not a three minute composition. It's a slow dance full of romance, a walk on the beach in the sand. It's having a whole conversation just by holding my hand. He would stir deep desire that sets me on fire to be with him all that I can. No, no, I won't settle for anything less than a real man. Chorus. A real man strung in stature, firm in faith, and kisses slow. He sometimes cries, and when we hug, he's the last one to let go. Worshiping the ground I walk on, he's my biggest fan. There's nothing like being loved by a real man. Most of you women are looking at me like, Who? <laughs> Stacy's on the front row, she's looking at me like, do you mind if I smoke? <laughs> she's like, okay, can you repeat, can you repeat that one chorus part, please? <laughs> Most of you gentlemen were looking at me like, oh, perfect. <laughs> I was interviewed on country radio in Nashville, Tennessee, and they said, how does a linebacker write a song like that? I said, it was easy. I made a list of things I wasn't, <laughs> and I decided I could become them. Not because it's expected by others, but because it's demanded of myself. We really do become the average of the five people we associate with the most. And according to our hero and friend Bob Proctor, who really quantified this law of attraction, the bottom line definition is we attract what we believe we deserve. What you deserve in a relationship, what you deserve in an income, what you deserve in a, in a relationship, what you deserve. Any of you have horses? Good segue, Dan, thanks. If you're looking for a hard to catch horse in the same field with an easy to catch horse, most of the time you end up with two hard to catch horses. And in the human experience, when you put a healthy child in the same room with a sick child, most of the time you end up with two sick children. Moral of the story to be disciplined, healthy, and significant. May I repeat, we must be willing to pay any price and travel any distance to associate with the extraordinary human beings who are healthy, disciplined and significant. I keep bringing up that word significance. It's the name of my new book, The Art of Significance, Achieving the Level Beyond Success. That was the last thing I learned being up in space for a five-hour sortie. In my opinion, the last thing, the most important thing we can take with us when we die, did my life matter? You think about the first quotes of Brendan Burchard. Didn't we hear this morning that Brendan Burchard, that Stephen Fielding was paying tribute to his buddy Jerry, and he quoted Brendan Burchard, did I live, did I love, and did I matter? When we die, I don't believe we lose our memory. I believe we have that recalling memory. Did I make a difference? Did I leave a legacy? And when I landed with all these new higher thoughts, this sense of consciousness answering the lifelong questions that I've asked every single day. Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? What's it really all about? I have a conversation with one of my football teammates who put it all together for me. He was drafted in the second round into the National Football League by the Philadelphia Eagles. After two years with the Eagles, he's traded to my Oakland Raiders. After four years in the league, playing at a superstar level, one day he walks out of practice, quits, never to play again. Why? He loved being a football player, but he hated playing football. He got what he wanted, but he hated what he got. He loved the celebrity perks and the fame and fortune that allowed him to live this existence we call successful, which is competing against others. Nice car, nice house, nice neighborhood, nice job title, nice salary. Success, getting what you think you want at the moment, selling your soul. Cody, doesn't the Bible say, yeah, too many 
gain the whole world and in the process lose their soul. That's what I got out of you, brother. My buddy, because he was successful and then realized that that was not enough, he would never allow himself to live this life of significance because his inner voice and his true purpose of life was misaligned with what he did. And therefore, he would have died with his music still in him. I've dined with presidents and shakes. I've interviewed the most famous, the, the most wealthy people on our planet. And without throwing anyone under the bus that was in the video, there are so many wealthy people who are so sad. And they're so unfulfilled because they chase the wrong thing. In my limited minutes with you, may I just share a few personal stories that accentuate what the real lessons of life need to be. The formula, the secret sauce, if you will, through storytelling, because I believe life is a story. In Chicken Soup for the Soul, we sold over 150 million copies. And all they are is anthology collections of three and a half page stories that connect our head with our heart and allow us to feel the message without, which outlasts the reading and the, and the reading light. With so much emphasis on our military, hear me, I just challenge all of us to, at some point in the next few days, figure out a symbol that we can put in our wallet, in our pocketbook, in our purse, on our refrigerator door, in our automobile, in our vehicle, in our office, somewhere that continuously reminds us that we better be the same off stage as we are on stage and there's no credibility. That we, we need to understand it's not enough for us to practice what we preach, we must preach only what we practice. And do we teach that? And do we learn it and watch for it and listen? I hope so. I've had an opportunity to go down range eight times to fire up our troops and entertain them. My first experience was way back in 2005. I was invited into uh, the, the, the combat zone downrange, as we call it. For 16 days, I was all over Afghanistan, all over Iraq, way up into Kirkuk, Mosul, down to Basra, Khalil, I was all over. Kuwait, four bases on Ku in Kuwait, Qatar, obviously, Djibouti, I, uh, you know, Ethiopia down to Addis Ababa, Abramunch. Had an experience of a lifetime and then put together some tours, eight since, excuse me, seven since that eight total. 16 days, well, 23 times on 12 bases and on the USS Harry S. Truman aircraft carried over 30,000 of our bravest men and women. Can one moment in time change our lives forever? Yes. Did for me. I'm in Bagram, Afghanistan, and after my speech, uh, a member of the 82nd Airborne, an Army Ranger, comes backstage and he presents me this bracelet that he had made out of this parachute cord. Which is really important because I've never taken it off. Never. I shower, I get out, it immediately dries. I still love to surf. I get out of the ocean, it immediately dries. Has a jump metal, miniature American flag, combat insignia, came in contact with the enemy, stories for another day. I wear this bracelet to continuously remind me it's not enough for us to practice what we preach. We must preach only what we practice. So as public figures, if we're real entrepreneurs, we don't think about location, location, location. We think about visibility, visibility, visibility. And as public figures, six degrees of separation that we heard about from the stage, in reality, it's four degrees, maybe three degrees of separation. What we have to understand is that as public figures, it's not enough for us to just buy one of those magnetic bows that says support our troops, stick it on the side of our vehicle and feel like we've done our civic duty. We better step it up. It's not enough for us to just see a soldier, a Marine, an airman, a sailor in an airport and say thanks. So I decided a long time ago that every time I saw a sailor, a Marine, an airman, a soldier in an airport, I would buy him or her a meal. What a drag. No one ever told me they don't hang out all by themselves. <laughs> <laughs> They're always in groups of three, five. When they find out it's three foot, I hear a whistle in the engine. <laughs> Nine guys in formation running out the door. Hey, hey, free Nathan's dogs, D5. <laughs> so is that enough? 
Can we just kick on character and click it off? Can we just kick on entrepreneurship and click it off? Can we just click on service and click it off? No. The entire reason we go to an airport isn't just to say thank you to our servicemen and women. It's to get on a plane. So I better take that same high level of commitment aboard the plane, don't you think? I'm a big guy, fortunate enough to fly for first class. And I'm built airlines. That's why I live in Utah, the best airline on the planet. They take really good care of me. I fly first class, I always get a window seat it's where I've written a lot of my books, a lot of my songs on the road. No one ever bothers me, I don't bother them. I boarded the plane, first class, window seat, I served the beverage, I'm kicking back, and now the rest of the passengers start coming aboard the plane. And you've all seen it as I have. There's always one passenger dragging that 411 pound carry-on bag down the aisle, holding up everyone. And if you're curious like me, you can usually see two air holes drilled in the top. They got Aunt Shirley inside. They refused to splurge for an extra ticket. Stop moving, we're gonna get arrested. They're dragging her down the aisle. It takes them 45 minutes to stick her up into the overhead. Now there's definite congestion. First class, sipping my beverage, window seat. I look left. All the passengers are stopped in the row and, and in the aisle, and they're stopped on my row is a soldier for you. So I chat him up. How you doing? He said, I'm fine, sir. I said, are you coming or going? He said, I'm just coming back from the desert, sir. They're always so polite. I said, where have you been? He said, I've been in Baghdad for 15 months, sir. I said, whoa, I bet you're, you're excited to see your family. He gets emotional. He says, yeah, I sure hope they're excited to see me. I said, guaranteed, bro. Welcome home. I want to swap seats. Oh, no, no, sir, that's not necessary. I said, what do you mean it's not necessary? It's the least I can do. The flight attendant overhears me, Mr. Clark, that's so nice of you. I said, it's not so nice of me. I said, I'm going to swap seats. You sit in my seat. You give him anything he wants. You take good care of him. Give me your seat or something. I'm going to the back of the plane to sit in your seat. I go to the back of the plane. I wish you know it. He's sitting in a center seat between two chubby guys. <laughs> and it's a four and a half hour cross country flight. <laughs> now I've lost 41 pounds since I got through playing football, but I'm still 6'5, weigh 235. I show up, these two, two guys are looking up at me like, oh no. I'm looking back at them like, double no, double no, excuse me, excuse me. I sit down, oh no. Let me interrupt, that's what's going to happen to us the second we leave this performing arts center tonight. When meltdown's over in a couple of days, it's exactly what's gonna happen. Why? We're all chipper. Get your name tags on. Everybody's like, wow, we laugh, we cry, we fell, we have these amazing speakers. And then all of a sudden we hit reality. And we're human, so we default. Man, I'm so old, I bend over to pull up my socks, and I think, what else can I accomplish while I'm way down here? <laughs> I'm stuck. I start thinking about the nights I go to bed healthy and I wake up injured and all I did was lay there. Is that starting to happen to some of you? <laughs> Come on, let's talk. You wake up, your hips asleep, your foot hurts, you're like, hey, what happened? I'm starting to stretch out in case something happens at 2 a.m. What allowed me to stop treating these men as objects in my way? There's nothing they can do for me, so I have a conversation to, oh my gosh. We came across on different ships originally, but we're all in the same boat now. And from space land, friends, and you see that we're all interconnected, living on the same sphere, dependent on one another to just make the best of this and teach each other what we need to know. We're brothers and sisters. It's not your air or my air, it's our air. It's not your water or my water, it's our water. I was never an environmentalist until we landed. I'm like, ah. Changed my whole mindset. And I stopped competing against others. I mean, half the guys here, look at the look at Jim, look at the MC. His hair has not moved since 1977. <laughs> it's just perfect, and I'm sensitive. I lose my hair right here, I'm growing it in places I don't even need it. <laughs> it's not a fair trade on. My only hope is that the hair in my right ear will grow long enough I can pull it up over the top of my head and take all of you out. In that moment, it was transformational for me. I don't have to compete or compare against anyone anymore. Same God who made you, made me too. And then four minutes later, I realized the true lesson of life, the true lesson of leadership, the true opportunity to leave a legacy and use our influence in any way we can. 
You see, I'm sitting there, now we're having this conversation, and I look up, and the guy who's sitting next to me in first class comes wandering to the back of the plane. We get eye contact. I said, what's up? He said, you made us all feel guilty. I said, what happened? He said, the next soldier got on board the plane. I gave him my seat. I said, hallelujah, brother. Let me help you find yours. And would you know, he's sitting in the row right in front of me in the center seat between two chubbier guys. He's so stuck, he can't even turn around and keep complaining. And by the time we took off, four guys who had been sitting in first class were now sitting in the back of the plane where we should have been all along to pay tribute to these amazing men in this case. Think about it. Who are willing, who are willing to give everything so that we can go to the mall? Are you serious? In the military, we give medals to those who are willing to sacrifice themselves so that others may live. And in business, we give bonuses to those who are willing to sacrifice others so that they may survive. We've got it bass backwards. That's the message I've gotten clear all day long from Meltdown. You are the right people to lead as an individual who can make a difference and spread this new message of service before self, realizing that most of us can't even put on a uniform to go fight. So we better be worth fighting for. Mm -hmm. And the story continues. I check into my hotel room, and I have a great night's sleep. Why? It's amazing when we do something for someone else when we believe we're not going to get the credit, how good we feel about ourselves and our human brother and sister connection. Next morning I wake up, shower, shake, put on my coat, my tie. I show up to the ballroom. 5,000 folks, huge national convention. And wouldn't you know it? The guy who introduces me is the guy who was sitting next to me in first class. The CEO of the company. We hadn't had a chance to get acquainted. He shows my little video, makes our introduction, my introduction, very intimate by saying that four of us in first class inspired one another to give our seats up to these soldiers in this case so that we have the opportunity to be here and never take our freedom for granted again. Moral to the story, people are watching and they will watch you every day, every minute. Will we be the same off stage as we are on stage? That's my challenge to myself every single day. And the reason why is because of an experience I had many years ago that led me to the stage. If I might share a transforma transformational uh, significant emotional event, I guess you'd have to call it. I played football for 13 years. One day in practice, the dream ended. We had a tackling drill, coach blew the whistle, two of us ran into each other full speed. Only parts of our bodies that made contact, Lyle's helmet crashed into my helmet in a head-on collision, a violent collision. My right shoulder was smashed into the cutting edge of my fiberglass pads, and we slammed to the ground. When Lau got off of me, my eye drooped, I had lost some speech, I couldn't talk anymore. My right side was paralyzed, my arm just dangled helplessly at my side. I had, I had compressed my seven cervical vertebrae in my neck, I had severed the axillary nerve in my right deltoid muscle, and I would suffered a grade level two concussion. In those days, late 70s, you didn't know a lot about concussions, I don't know how many of you have seen the movie. I basically just perspired profusely, shook like a leaf, threw up myself, threw up on myself and cried myself to sleep. I'm laying on the ground. Coach comes running over, Clark, Clark, you all right? What happened? Rock and so, Rokas are from Adam's room. He says, whoa, are you from Mesa? I'm just kidding. <laughs> he said, you better just lay there. I said, whoo. A doctor that was present on the field, he came over and he examined me. He pulls the coach aside. He says, Clark's got serious nerve damage. In fact, he might even have serious brain damage. Coach looks at him and says, how will we ever know? Nice guy. I thought that was funnier than you did. <laughs> I, mean, I went back to normal. My speech came back. I could basically talk again. But my right side stayed paralyzed and my arm dangled at, myself, at my side. I talked to him and it wouldn't move. It scared me to death. I stayed paralyzed for 14 months. I went to 16 of the very best doctors in all of North America, and every single one of them told me I would never get any better. Have you ever heard that? Mm -hmm. What happens if you believe it? 
You never get any better. Isn't it interesting? People say all the time, Clark, why did you go to 16 different doctors? You know why? Because 15 of them did not believe I would get better. I was in search of somebody who believed that I would get better. I was in search of finding someone who believed that if I just did what I needed to do, I could fully recover. PTSD now, the new science, there's no D. It's not a, it's not a, a syndrome. It's not post-traumatic stress disorder. We're looking at it now as an injury, and with an injury, you can get better. And because I've broken my body up so many times, you know what I've decided and discovered? That if we go through the proper steps of rehabilitation, however long that takes, with people who believe we can get better, every part of our body that was injured becomes stronger than it was before we injured it, including our heads and our hearts and our souls and our dreams. We need to hang around with the right people who will trigger more passion, creativity, and imagination. And now that I've recovered, I'm asked the oddest question, Clark, what took you so long? <laughs> so I feel like I have a right to ask any audience of any size. If you're going to change, what's holding you back? What's taking you or me so long? For me, I stayed paralyzed for 14 months because I was asking the wrong questions. I was asking the doctors how to get better when I should have been asking myself why. And once we answer why, figuring out the how-to is pretty simple. And when your why is bigger than your why not, you can sustain. But with Sharon Lecter's wisdom, now we're need to, needing to ask ourselves why not? Who's holding me back? What's in my way? Why not? Why not? And I believe in her, and I believe in her wisdom, and I challenge all of us to do the same. When we start understanding our why, and ask the question, why not, why not me? I suspect that there's nothing we could not accomplish as individuals or as a group. Especially if we start focusing in on service before self. May I ask you another question? What are you willing to do that no one else is willing to do? Competitive advantage is not created by doing more than our competition. It's created by doing what our competition is not willing to do. Can I share a story? My family matters to me. My dad's my hero. He was a cotton farmer on the east side of Phoenix here in the Mesa area. He became very, very successful in the early 1960s. He started his own insurance company, his own financial corporation. He became very, very successful. Never an athlete, dark hair, dark eyes. My mom, the greatest mom who ever lived, youngest of nine children raised by a single mom. Anybody here raised by a single mom? We love them. Anybody here a single mom? We love you. My mother is 89 years old. On August 6th, she turns nine. You were going to have a blowout party. She comes to hear me speak a little while ago. She hasn't been in my audience forever. I, I introduced her to the audience. Everybody was so gracious. And I said, yeah, my mom at 89, she still inspires everyone with whom she comes in contact. The other day, my mom goes to the doctor for an annual physical. The doctor says, Ruby, you need, a, you need more exercise. So she signed up for an aerobics class for seniors. And sure enough, she bent over, jumped up and down, twisted and turned, perspired for over an hour. But by the time she got her leotard on, the class was over. <laughs> and my mom's on the front row, that's not true. That's not funny. I love my mom, never an athlete, dark hair, dark eyes. Older brother Sam, genius, owner of seven, seven, yeah, seven degrees from major universities, father of four, successful business owner, successful business operator, never an athlete, dark hair, dark eyes. Older sister, amazing realtor. Amazing. My younger brother Paul, superstar, very wealthy investment banker. And then there's me. Can any of you relate? Can you see my parents in a social setting? So what does your son Dan do? Oh, he talks. We're so freaking proud. <laughs> <laughs> the story I want you to remember about my sweet dad is his battle with cancer. He battled cancer for six and a half years. Two months before he died, he gathered all of our family together and he said, what are all of you learning from this? We need to challenge answers. Question the answers. 
figure out what messages we're supposed to take home from this meltdown that will transform our lives forever. My dad battled cancer for six and a half years. I wanted to be by his bedside when he took his last breath. That didn't happen for me. I was up in Seattle, Washington for two days. I was speaking to two large trade associations downtown at the convention center. I'm staying out of town at the Seattle airport Marriott Hotel. It's Friday morning, October 12th. I showered, I shaved, put on my coat, put on my time, ready for the day, as usual. Phone rings. I think it's my ride downtown to the convention center, so I pick up the phone and I almost literally say, I'll be right there. But for some odd reason, I just stood there. Fifteen seconds of silence later, my younger brother's voice pierces the quietness of the call. Danny? I said, what's up, Paul? He said, Dad died this morning at 7 a.m. I said, whoa. I sat down on the edge of my bed, and the tears just started to fall. I'm interrupted. I'd give anything to have my dad back one more day. It's too late. I have regrets. I don't wish regrets on anyone. I'm an author, and my favorite interview is always with an elderly person, elderly meaning someone older than me. <laughs> and they will always remind all of us that they never have regrets for things they did do. They only have regrets for things they did not do. Will you at this meltdown? Will you today? Will you any day? I said to my brother, Paul, how's mom? He said, she's all right. I said, give her a big hug and a kiss for me, will you please? Tell, me I'll tell her I'll phone her as quickly as I can. And then he asks me the gajillion dollar question, what are you going to do? And I've already amended it for meltdown. What are you willing to do that no one else is willing to do? Wow, that's how we differentiate ourselves through service before self. Not because it's expected by others, but because it's demanded of ourselves. I want to be a real man. I don't want to be a real woman, whatever that means. I said to my brother, you know, I need you to just, just ask mom how she's doing and let me know and tell her I love her and give her a big kiss and tell her I'll phone her as quickly as I can. He says, what are you going to do? I said, well, dad and mom have spent an entire lifetime teaching us to keep our promises. I said, I can't imagine what it would be like to be a meeting planner with a 90-minute slot to fill 3,500 people in the audience and not have the speaker show. I'm going to go speak. That's what dad would want me to do. Keeps his legacy alive and his good name intact. I said, and then I'm going to spend the night and I'm going to keep my commitment on Saturday. I'm going to speak and then I'm going to hustle home. God knows I need your support and hopefully I can give you some of mine. I hung up the phone with my brother and I sat there in my hotel room and I openly wept like a wee child. This is my dad, my hero. In one of my most famous songs, used to get a lot of radio play, I wrote about my sweet dad. It's called Special Man. Lyrical hook, any male can be a father, but it takes a special man to be a dad. That's my guy, my hero. My dad was a World War II vet, commander of the 3rd Reconnaissance Battalion, and in the meeting that actually designed and created the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki that brought our war to an end. My father-in-law was shot down in his first mission as a 19-year-old in a B-17, spent a year as a POW in a Nazi concentration camp. My dad's cousin, Mervyn S. Benyon, who was the commanding officer of the USS West Virginia, died at Pearl Harbor on deck of his ship as it went down and as a recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor. I have a military legacy that teaches me to keep my promises, to keep my commitments, no matter what. It is not enough to say I will do my best. We must succeed in doing that which is necessary. And I've never had a uniform on. God forgive me. One percent of America's population even qualified to serve in our military. Because only one percent of our population thinks the way they think. And connects their heart and their head with purpose and service before self. I write a lot of speeches for celebrities. I've had the opportunity to write two speeches for recent Medal of Honor recipients. It's not an award, they didn't win anything. They're the most humble individuals who say, you know what, they were ordinary, but when put in this situation, leadership became automatic and they had to step up and do something extraordinary. So I honor every single person in this room who has worn a uniform or perhaps is currently wearing a uniform. I honor your commitment to service before self, and I know that that commitment was ingrained in me as a young man 
as I watched the legacy left behind from my relatives and loved ones, especially as I grew older, to appreciate it. So how can you say no? I hung up the phone with my brother. I openly wept like a reach out. Fifteen minutes later, the phone rings again. This time it is my ride. I tell him I'll be right down. I go to the washroom. I splash some water on my face. Start to freshen up to the best of my ability. I leave my hotel room with me and get on the elevator. As the elevator doors start to close, the corner of the billman's cart nudges its way through the opening and they bing back open. And on the elevator comes this way overzealous psycho billman. I'll never forget him as long as I live. He's pushing this runway cart onto the elevator, forces me back to the right rear corner of the elevator, and I assume the elevator position. <laughs> doors close, we start going down, and he is relentless. Woo! You see the beautiful sunshine? He said, I've lived up here in Seattle, Washington. 15 years rained every single day. You must have brought the good weather with you. How are you doing? I said, I'm fine. You know when someone's been staring at you for a while and you don't even have to get eye, con eye contact and you just kind of feel it, you just kind of sense it. All of a sudden he says, hey mister, you're not fine. You've been crying. I said, yeah, I said, I just found out my dad died this morning and I'm really sad. He said, whoa. Elevator comes to the lobby, the door's open, he goes his way, I meet my ride. He drives me downtown to the convention center, I'm introduced and I make my speech. I had to dig deeper than I'd ever dug in my whole entire life to make that speech, but you can if you think you can. If your why is bigger than your why not, and now a share elector asking why not. I got to the end of my speech, and I said to the audience, I'd like to conclude with a little song for one of my albums. And I said, the reason why I want to sing this little song is because my dad died this morning, and it's the first time he's ever heard me sing it in public. And I dug deeper than I'd ever dug and maybe sing the song better than I'd ever sung it. I concluded my speech and I had the driver take me to the Seattle Aquarium. Am I now a hypocrite? I honor our troops who have the guts and the balls to run towards the sound of the guns while bad guys are trying to pick them off to keep them from returning home safely to their families while we're at the mall. And now I'm saying, I can't handle it. Give me a cocktail. No! I had the driver take me to the Seattle Aquarium to create a meeting. A meltdown where we really can ask better questions and get better answers and be safe with our vulnerability, with our connections, with our ability to communicate and ask better questions, but more importantly, challenge the questions so we leave here different than we were when we arrived. So I'm at the aquarium watching the fish swim, watching the otters float on their backs. They reminded me of some of the offensive line when I used to play ball with. But that's the environment where I started writing some of my, my, my more profound statements. Pain is a signal to grow, not to suffer. And once you learn the lesson the pain teaches you, the pain goes away. So in life, there's no mistakes, only lessons. How about crisis does not make or break the man or woman? It just reveals the true character within. How about if you spend your entire day wondering if your glass is half empty or half full? You've missed the point. It's refillable. <laughs> Thinking positively or thinking negatively does not fill up the glass. The pouring does. It's easier to act our way into positive thinking than it is to think our way into positive action. It's not the sugar that makes it tea sweet. It's the stirring. It's the process. Under pressure, you don't step up your game. You succumb to the level of your preparation, training, and practice. Which means pressure is not something that is naturally there. It's created when you question your own ability. And when you know what you've been trained to do, there's never any pressure. That's why we train and practice so freaking hard. That's why I honor every single person in this room and in the entire world who stands tall as an American soldier, airman, sailor, or Marine. Because on a daily basis, I honor you at the same time asking myself, could I have done what you did? And the answer humbly is, there's no freaking way. You guys are so amazing. You think about it. The driver takes me back to the Seattle airport, Marriott Hotel. Here's where you come into my story. Here's where you come into my remarks. I walk into my hotel room, and there on the dresser of drawers is a basket of fruit. And it's not your basic basket of fruit that's been delivered from the hotel gift shop. We've all seen these little cover cellophane in a bow. 
little sterile staff card. They never get our names right. Thanks for staying with us, Sergio. <laughs> this was the coolest gift I'd ever received. It was a broken smush basket. One side was completely caved in. It looked like with some second thought, maybe after hours, no resources available. They still wanted to make a difference. Can you relate? I can see this hotel employee walking through the lobby, and they look at the garbage bin. They're like, oh, whoa, that's too good to throw away. Oh, Colby will be really proud of us. Do more with less. They retrieved it. They took it to my room. Whoever delivered it obviously was in a presentation because he turned the broken Swiss part of the basket towards the wall. <laughs> Whoever delivered it obviously walked past that big fake tree in the lobby, he ate up one of those fine rubberized leaves, stuck that in front of the broken smoosh part of the basket. In my basket of fruit, there's a tomato. <laughs> and a big giant carrot. And a handwritten card that said, Mr. Clark, I'm sure sorry your dad died. I'm supposed to get off work at 5 o'clock. I've asked to stay on all night long so I can be here just for you. Room service closes at 10 o'clock. The kitchen has agreed to stay open all night long so they can be here just for you. If you need anything, just call and ask for me. Signed, James, the bellman in the elevator. <laughs> He's not the only guy who signed my little card. Every single hotel employee that night at the Seattle airport, Marriott Hotel, signed my little card. I still have a mat in a frame hanging on my office wall to this day. Let me debrief, debrief and conclude. Here we have the lowest paid person in the entire employee payroll who seemingly gets it. Guess what? Money can't be a motivator. We're not entrepreneurs to make money. That's the report card from service before self. Here we have the youngest person in the entire employee payroll who seemingly gets it. Guess what? Ha! Age has nothing to do with achieving success or becoming significant. How do we know that? Some of the greatest songs ever written were written by young men and young women. Why? They have access to the same 12 notes that the old folks do. At the end of the day, it's about passion, creativity, and imagination. And figuring out a way to use our craft and our talent to communicate in any way we possibly can. Those of us who love music sometimes choose that over the spoken word any day for all the obvious reasons. And the last thing I learned from this young 18-year-old man Time really does matter. Today you've never been this old before, and today you'll never be this young again, so right now and every right now matters, remember? One moment in time changes everything. So before we leave, we better celebrate who we are in the collection of Meltdown and why we decided to come and affiliate and associate with one another. Why? Because outside of these walls is a minimum requirement mediocrity. And we're going to have to return to it at some point. Will we be strong enough? Can we stand that? I don't know. Every time I get on an airplane tomorrow night, I gotta fly out. And every time any of us get on an airplane, we are subjected to and force-fed minimum requirement mediocrity with this, this pre-flight safety demonstration. Kansas kept referring to the positive part of it. Put your own, own mask on first. I loved his analogy. But it brought back bad memories for me. Every time we get on a plane, what do they say? In the event of a decrease in cabin pressure, an oxygen mask will appear. Reach up, tug on the gold cup, place it over your nose and mouth, secure your tight with the elastic strap, breathe normally. You're going down! <laughs> breathe normally. They're freaking. They're idiots! <laughs> and they always give me brain damage. Bring your seat up to the most upright and uncomfortable position. This kills me. Alive, dead. Alive, dead. Alive, dead. I survived a plane crash in 1988, Shenandoah Valley Airport, Stanton, Virginia. Trust me, when you finally land, an inch and a half does not make a difference. There's crap everywhere. And the flight attendants lie on every flight. They stand up in front of us, we're here for your safety. No, they're not. When you're going down there, strapped in and screaming, just like we are. <laughs> just once, I want them to give me the microphone. Let me tell people aboard the plane what really happens in an emergency. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in the event of a decrease in cabin pressure, a little gold cup's going to conk you in the head. <laughs> when you stop screaming, brace yourself for a 200 feet per second vertical dive. And if you're traveling with more than one child, pick your favorite. Because <laughs> <laughs> you ain't got time to make another choice. What happens when we 
get on a flight, and the flight attendant isn't about minimum requirement. It's not about doing the job. It's about making flying fun and service before self and making us pay attention to the lessons of life, the safety message. Is that not contagious? Can we not be that person every day of our life so everyone leaves us saying, I like me best when I'm with you, I want to see you again. I like me best when I'm with you, I want to see you again. I like me best when I'm with you, I want to see you again. Is that hard? No, I'm on a Delta Airlines flight, we're coming into Dallas. We hit huge turbulence, we're bouncing all over the sky. We finally land, we bounce, we land, we bounce, we land. Bird taxi in the gate. Flight attendant comes over to the PA system. Hi, <laughs> welcome to Dallas, Texas. If you enjoyed your flight, tell your friends you flew Delta Airlines. If you did not enjoy your flight, tell your friends you flew Southwest. <laughs> and everybody on the plane goes, hi. <laughs> and obviously the flight attendant had a great relationship with leadership because she then says, and please remain seated with your seatbelt fastened while Captain Kangaroo bounces us the rest of the way to the game. <laughs> That's funny. And is it contagious? Yeah. An elderly woman walking in the aisle behind you with her cane. Ksh, ksh, ksh. She comes to the doorway. Are you the pilot? Yes, ma'am. Did we really land or did we get shot down? <laughs> what do you want to do? My clothes. Not alone, but together. My favorite clothes, I turn into a country hit. A mother encourages her daughter to come home as soon as school is over. The time comes, the time goes. Thirty minutes later, daughter walks in through the front door of her home and her mother scolds her. Where have you been? She says, oh, mommy, I walked my friend Sally home. She dropped her doll on the sidewalk and broke all the pieces. It was awful. Her mother says, you're late because you stayed. You helped your friend pick up the pieces of the doll and put it back together again? She said, oh, no, mommy, I didn't know how to fix the doll. I just stayed to help her cry. Now that we've had this meltdown experience, we're connected in a different way. And it's our responsibility to figure out what that reason is. I'll hope that you'll keep in touch with me. I'll do whatever I need to do to keep in touch with you. I hope you'll resonate before you leave this arena, before you leave the meltdown on the official capacity of the closing ceremony or whatever we're going to do at the pool. <laughs> Still reminisce of the messages of all these amazing human beings who I've had the privilege of, of spending time with on this stage. And we won't just share tears of sadness, but we'll be there for each other, tears of joy and victory, and why life is worth living every single day of our lives. I had heart surgery four Fridays ago. And at my age, that's a wake-up call. When you live your whole life feeling invincible, and you get to go mock two with your hair on fire and then realize that this might be the last day. Without going there, what would happen if it was? Will everyone say of you, which is my new challenge to myself, I like me best when I'm with you, I want to see you again? If that's the case, leaving a legacy becomes automatic. And leaving a legacy is what this entire conference, what meltdown and what our lives should and need to be. It's an honor to be in the same room with anyone from military 